<laughs> All right, guys. How we doing? We're gonna be doing a uh, another quick Facebook Live. We uh, we have some really neat stuff going on, and I thought I'd stop in. I'm gonna try to do a shorter one today, not one that runs an hour and 15 minutes, hour and 30 minutes like before. Those go way too long. Um, I don't have any really in-depth uh, tech that we're going to be breaking apart like last time. So I thought it would be a good opportunity to kind of check in, see how things are going with you guys, and um, basically kind of do a, a little quick update. Uh, if you guys, if uh, anyone's paying attention and you saw kind of a massive spam fest last night, um, I'm actually going to be on uh tonight's episode of the yeah buddy productions rec ride podcast uh last week i think it was last week they had jerry gaddis from green hulk for their first episode and they reached out to me and said hey we'd love to have you you know you know we thought you'd be a, a fun guest I said sure no problem um quite frankly i have no idea what we're going to talk about so i'm pretty sure they're going to tr just try to squeeze 2021 secrets out of me which is pretty dumb because that stuff's coming out in like a couple weeks um but anyhow uh so yeah if you guys uh if you guys are interested please tune in tonight it's gonna be on facebook just like this um uh, and it's eight o'clock eastern standard time and uh i'm gonna try i know that the yeah buddy productions guys they're gonna have it on obviously their their facebook page I'll try to share it on the Watercraft Journal, but I might be on my phone doing this live, so I don't know if I can share it or not. We'll, we'll see. Um, but other than that, uh, it should be fun. I, I think I'm only on for like 15, 20 minutes, but you guys should watch. I think they do an hour or maybe like 45 minutes to an hour. So yeah, check it in. It's uh, Ken, uh, Ken and Jason. Uh, from New Jersey and uh, they do a lot of really fun stuff together and they do a, and they're really they're really passionate more about the rec rides the rec uh, the recreation segment uh, they don't really get into like the whole racing thing they're not typically stand-up guys so it's gonna be a lot of sit-down stuff and primarily like long-distance rides and fun fun rides for people you know on weekends and things like that so they're they're really uh, more interested towards quite frankly, the meat and potatoes of the personal watercraft industry. So that's, that's a smart move. Uh, <laughs> um, some of you guys might have seen, I am back uh, off the wagon on caffeine. <laughs> I uh, didn't sleep much last night, so uh, I needed, needed a little pick-me-up. I shouldn't be, I, I, that was my New Year's resolution was to get off of caffeine. Um, my caffeine day, intake was through the roof and uh, Rockstar was my drug of choice. So uh, I promise after that, I'll be giving that up. I gotta give up soda, no, no more sugar water, no more, no more caffeine. So that's my promise to you guys, is that I, I, I promise not to have an embolism from drinking too much caffeine. Um, Today is going to be kind of a kind of a quickie. I wanted to address a couple things that are actually um, seeing a lot of questions, a lot of just misinformation that's going out. Uh, there's a few people who have an axe to grind, and I thought it'd be a good opportunity to kind of talk about some stuff. Uh, first, I do want to talk about uh, <laughs> coffee, coffee, coffee. Uh, yeah, that's uh, yeah. Um, uh, I have friends who are heavy duty coffee drinkers. In fact, I had a roommate who was a hardcore coffee drinker and I found that dude, um, not to be too graphic, but I think I was about 19 years old or 20 years, I was 19 years old and I heard screaming coming out of the other side of the apartment and he was literally curled up in a ball in the shower because uh, he was trying, it, all of a sudden it, it kicked on, he was trying to pass a kidney stone and he was stark naked, just crying in the shower. And um, he ended up having to get like three kidney stones blasted. They had to radio, you know, they, they radio signal blast, they sonar blast those things and try to get them to pass out, you know, pass through the urethra. So uh, coffee, although I love 
the smell of coffee. I never liked the taste of it. I don't drink it. So that my my insane caffeine intake came from uh, came from Rockstar back when I was at Personal Watercraft Illustrated. Uh, the Rockstar guys came to the Cycle News offices and they saw that I was doing jet ski racing. They said, "Well, hey, let's let's slap our stickers on your ski and." call you a sponsored racer. I said, oh, okay, that sounds fun, you know, and so I got the big yellow star on the helmet and threw some stars on the ski and suddenly flats of rock stars started showing up at my office. And um, I couldn't say no, and then I just absolutely drank rock star like it was going out of style. Um, and getting into my late 30s, early 40s, I started realizing that I was not functioning without like high doses of caffeine and then when I would try to go cold you know when I try to kick it and, and just like okay I gotta stop drinking this crap um, I'd, I, I would just be sweating I would get I actually would get really high anxiety and be a I'm already a stress case and you know the stereotypical redhead with a short fuse so it was just exacerbating everything um, and I think it came to a head when I started buying flats through Amazon on my own. And my wife's like, this isn't happening. You cannot do this. So I grabbed, I grabbed a couple rock stars earlier this week. I made a cannonball run up to a transmission shop for the other magazine. And you got to do what you got to do. Red Bull tastes like freaking like 108 race gas to me. And I've tried all the different flavors. I can't, oh, I can't take Red Bull. Um, maybe, maybe because it's not so sugary and this tastes like a soda pop. I don't know. Um, plus I don't like the carb. I don't like carbonation all that much. So, uh, this stuff isn't carbonated and, uh, n not to play devil's advocate, but if you guys like an orange Julius at the mall, you know what I mean? An orange Julius, you know, the whipped orange, you know, and orange Julius has a strawberry and has an orange, you know, like a strawberry Julius and an orange Julius. Rockstar made a, ser uh, made a pair of orange cream and then strawberry cream whipped Rockstars and they taste identical to an orange Julius or a strawberry Julius and that's just that's just straight cocaine. I mean that's just oh my gosh those are so good and I, I knew I had a problem when it came to that. I was like okay I, I mean the sugar contents like eating a slice of cheesecake and it was like hey, um, I'm gonna start my morning with a slice of cheesecake. So don't get into those. They're phenomenal, but but yeah. Honestly, it's a drug. It alters your brain chemistry. <laughs> Stop it. At least at least for me. I can't tell you what to do. It's free country. You you know, I'm not your mom. Go ahead and do what you want. But please. Yeah, I, I, I had to I, I have to get away from this stuff. Um so in addition to some cool news with me being on the podcast tonight with the guys from Yeah Buddy. Um, I know Bobby Car uh, Bobby Cardone wanted to drag me in on one. He's saying we're going to have a debate. I don't know what we're debating. Um, I'm a little scared of that. Uh, it kind of sounds like he wants to have an argument over something. There's Bobby right now. Oh, crap. Speak of the devil. His ears must have been burning. But, yeah, so Bobby uh, also pitched the idea of me coming in. And doing a doing a debate again. I think I'm 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 gonna be showing up to a firing squad, but who knows? He might have notes. <laughs> um, he might be like, "Hey, what about this? What about this? And you were wrong on this." I'm like, "Okay, fine. I was wrong. I'll, I'll own it." Um, but anyway, anyway. So, you know, a lot of guys are jumping up on the podcast game and they're getting into this kind of stuff. Um, I'd rather ramble because I like the sound of my own voice and I think I'm smart. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, you know, it, it's really cool. It's neat to see a lot of these guys getting into that. I think it's really good to have discourse. I think, I think that's healthy and I don't care if we're talking jet skis or politics or religion or cars or whatever interests you. All right. You could be, you could be having a discourse over fishing lures as far as I care, but as long as everyone's having a really good conversation, points are being able to be shared and, and quite frankly, everyone's voice gets to get heard. I think that's healthy discourse. That's kind of what this country was founded upon. So anyway, that's the whole idea with being involved with a lot of these podcasts. I collaborate with a lot of people. I've commonly 
talked about Jerry and I doing stuff and always talking and I talked to a lot of other guys. Um, it's just that Jerry's okay with me name dropping them. So some people are kind of like, hey, keep it on the down low, uh, which is fine. Um, so if it's not if it's not tomorrow, it'll be Sunday night at midnight. We will have our video and article review of the 2020 Yamaha GP 1800R HO. This is the Wave Runner, formerly known as the VXR. Okay. Um, Excuse me. All, all that really is a difference of his name. It's a marketing thing. And I know we talked about it before. And now the rock star is coming to get me. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, basically, that was a marketing choice when it came to changing the name. Was that they wanted more of a, was more of a family, uh, kind of a family relation between the GP1800R and the VXR. And they thought, well, they're identical skis except for the engine and pump. You know, the 160 versus the 155, the HO versus the SVHO. So they wanted to make the model unit called the GP1800R and then des designate the differences by the engines. Um, unfortunately, what results is a massive uh, alphanumeric name that's 12 digits long. And I mean, it just kind of garbles things and it doesn't really roll off the tongue. Um, I've been an advocate since like 2000, ever, <laughs> really since ever, of giving them names. Uh, you know, I, I, I jokingly like back in like 2008 was talking to the guys at CDU. I'm like, why don't you name them like, you know, the Barracuda or the Tiger Shark? Well, not Tiger Shark, but, you know, the Mako Shark or the Great White or the whatever, you know, the, I don't care, Man of War, whatever. And they laughed because they said, oh, well, actually, the names that we have internally do have actual names they call you know like the gti was called the dolphin and they had like the phoenix platform and they had actual names for a lot of these watercraft but then when they come out it's alphanumeric gobbledygook it's alphabet soup and i was like guys give it a cool name you know i mean i don't know that's me personally you know i'd rather see a cool name with a logo than a bunch of names and letters and numbers but that's not going to change anytime soon an rxpx 300 an rxtx 300 a, a gp 1800 rho they're kind of already branded um it's it's a little bit set in stone so it's really hard to kind of just shove that genie back in the back in the lamp um anyway so we're going to have the GP1800R HO review coming up. I'm hoping for tomorrow. Or, yeah, I really don't think the video is coming in tonight. But otherwise, it's going to be showing up over the weekend. Um, and then it'll be ready live Monday morning. And then I have a bunch of other review product coming up. In fact, I brought visual, <laughs> I brought visual aids. Um, Slippery's 20, uh, 2020 catalog. Uh, they're cranking out all their con uh, all their products. You know, obviously we have some international shipping problems going on with the whole COVID thing, and that's worldwide. And so much of the stuff from Slippery and Thor and Parts Unlimited comes from Thailand. Uh, we have their new race boots. Um, there's minor material differences on these, and we're actually kind of excited about that, uh, especially with the boot. And it's kind of hard to show this, but. And I I should have brought the my old boots out was the old race boot had a really thick heavy almost naga hide style um uh brace that that was stitched into the back around the heel and around the ankle uh the problem is that after about two or three uses and really one use in salt water that brace became rock hard and it was it was really hard get your foot in and out and it just, and then it would fray and it would tear well they've changed it to more of a laminated vinyl and it's got a, a little bit more of a sheen um but the nice thing is is that it's not as thick and it's not as binding and so you actually have a lot more flexibility and what they've also added is they've added a kind of a heavy rubberized textured uh textured grip 
I hate saying it, it, it feels a little bit like grip tape that you'd put on your skateboard. Uh, not, as, not as rough, obviously, not as sandpapery, but it has that really good grip. And this, I thought, and I used it, I've used them once so far. And one of the best things about these is that if you're handle, if you're on a watercraft and you're getting, you're dropping your knee and you're really getting into the, you know, the handling and getting, you know, cutting corners and getting your shoulders up over the bars, is that you typically, unless you have foot wedges on a watercraft, you position your feet out like this so you shove them in. You know, your toes are pressed up against the, the gunnel and then your heel is kind of shoved up against uh, the inside of the deck. And that extra grip is going to help bind your foot in there and give you some added traction. So, uh, so far, I've been really happy with, with the new slight, it's a very, mo it's a mild redesign. It's primarily material that they're changing. Um, but the material choices that they've made uh, so far have been really good. I wish, I wish I had a whole year's worth of testing before I did an, an article, but I think we're going to do a, a preliminary trial test, uh, you know, two months in of using the boot and then uh, I might come back after using them for a year and say here's how they held up over the year. Um, the, I got uh, three other things from Slippery. I haven't even opened these yet but uh, these are the new circuit gloves from from Slippery and since now everything here is gonna be Slippery. Slippery is an advertiser with the magazine. They are also the official uh, race or riding apparel for the video channel. So we get, quite frankly, we get first first dibs on a lot of the slippery stuff. And these these gloves, um, I'm actually op opening them up live. Uh, they do fit tight, all right? Even if, like, I wear an XL for my hands. Um, they strap on pretty tight. And that can be both an annoyance to some people and a really great benefit um, to other folks. Now, I prefer them a little bit tighter. I, I don't mind that they run a little bit smaller because what happens, at least for me, in riding, a lot of motion, a lot of give, if they're, if they're looser, you're gonna get a lot of blisters and you're gonna get a lot of wear on your hands, okay? Um, but the constant contact might bother some people. Um, I'm going to err on the side of a tighter fit because a tighter fit is going to give you a little bit more of a firmer feel. So again, um, that's going to be preferential to however you like it. But in our review of these, which we have done reviews of previous gloves, I almost always err on the side of being a little bit tighter than too loose. And let's see, we got two more things. All right, we got the new rash guard. That they just this is actually really funny was that uh, about a year and a half ago they launched their new board short and Ernesto stop asking for free crap Ernesto <laughs> these aren't the things I'm giving away I'm giving away some other stuff and that's at the end um, these things I have to test these are for the <laughs> yes sir <laughs> I'm, giving, I'm giving you a hard time all right was about two years ago they came out with a board short and the board short was kind of like a like a night camouflage it was like black and midnight blue and gray and um but they had nothing to go with it and now they got a rash guard with the same pattern and so we're going to be wearing this rash guard with the shorts um and seeing if how the rash guard fits and you know a lot of a, a lot of rash guards are really tight around the neck um and for guys with a thick neck not me i Used to, when I worked out, I my neck was, yeah, I actually had some pretty good lats. Um, but, well, lats are these. I mean, my neck would fill out. And uh, shows how much I work out. And rash guards were choking me. They were just way too tight. So, uh, so far with the, their rash guard, the, the collar actually rolls in. So it's a little bit looser. It's a little bit nicer. So, um, that's going to be, uh, that's kind of a bonus right there. All right. So one more thing is, and I, and I know this does not mean anything to a lot of you guys and, but it's important that 
we test these, and that is we've got uh, we've got Slippery's new race john, all right, the new wetsuit, and why? I mean, most guys will go their entire lives without ever wearing a uh, without ever wearing a wetsuit, and I, I joke we Jerry and I would joke it's like the like ninety nine point eight percent of jet skiers will never put a helmet on. They just don't have the use for a helmet. Well, those who do, and those who consider wearing a helmet, even if they're not racers, um, I actually advocate wearing a helmet if you're riding the stand-up. Um, I like having teeth, and uh, especially when we had the SXR 1500 for about six, seven months, um, I never rode it without a helmet, except for twice and I was very uncomfortable not wearing a helmet, um, especially on that, that unit, uh, because of the speed of it, the size of it, how it behaved. Uh, I, I, almost, I always put a helmet on, and, um, and I had to, and, I, and believe it or not, it came in handy uh, twice. Yeah, boy, I, 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 I whacked my face one time, um, but, uh, the race John the reason we grabbed the race John quite frankly is because we'll be testing some watercraft in the coming weeks that require me to wear a, a wetsuit I Won't go any further detail, but it is helpful to be wearing a wetsuit while riding these particular machines uh, and already I can tell you is that they've made some really good material choices for the race John. Now the race John is not a full suit. This is this is a thinner. It's a it's a thinner millimeter. I think it's a 3M, not a 5M. Um, and what what's nice about that is that it's also perforated. And I don't know if I can get in the camera and show. There we go. You can see the perforations, especially at your joints. All right, that's at the ankle, and the same perforations are in the knee. Okay, but on the other side of the knee, look at the material they got. It's a grip material. Can you hear my finger scratching that? I'm trying to get the microphone to hear it. Okay, they have an actual textured pad on the knee that isn't a big bulky pad. And um, so I'm actually really excited about this because the majority of this, of this wetsuit is this perforated stretch material. This is the most flexible wetsuit I think I've ever put on. Um, and so, yeah, even the back. Here, check this out. I think you can even see the perforations in the back. The only thing that's actually a la like a laminated heavy material is the chest and, and stomach area, okay? Um, so these are, wow, look at the brief of this sounds a little funny and I don't mean to be graphic, but let's take a look at the crotch. <laughs> the crotch material is even thinner. You can actually see daylight through it. All right. So it breathes. No more swamp. No more swamp crotch. This is cool. I didn't even consider that. I didn't even look at that. All right. So we're actually really excited about this race, John. Um, I look forward to doing some stuff on that one. I think that's gonna be really neat. So I'm excited about some of the new materials that they're choosing to use in their riding gear. Um, so you're gonna be seeing that stuff coming out, quite frankly, over the off season. So that way you can kind of gear up and be ready for next year's season. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about dashboards. Let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the new features that we're seeing coming from manufacturers and what it might mean. This is all speculative. And, and, and some of the points I'm talking about when it comes to future tech, it's going to be speculative. So, because I honestly, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying this, you know, scout's honor, I do not know what SeaDo is doing for a fact. I know what Yamaha is doing in some ways, but not everything. Okay, so... First, I wanted to talk about one thing. I had a guy, and he, he was very well-meaning, and he reached out, and he's a fan of the magazine, and he says, hey, listen, I got a really big problem with my Yamaha. He's got an FX, 
I, I think it's an SVHO. And he said, the 19s and 20s have this major flaw. And I go, oh, well, okay, well, what's the flaw? And I'm pretty, pretty familiar with the watercraft. And he says, oh, well, there's a, there's a major issue with the dashboard. And I said, there, there is. I haven't heard that. And he says, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, uh, the fuel gauge chimes too soon. I go, oh, well, that's, that's not the dashboard. He goes, no, it is. This is the dashboard. I said, no. I actually talked. I mean, because the joke is that uh, the first two bars on the Yamaha FXs take forever to drop, especially if you have an HO, because the fuel, the fuel economy is, quite frankly, really good. And with an 18 and a half gallon tank, it takes a while to take the fuel float. And if let's just pretend this is a gas tank. There's your fuel pump is actually vertical in the you know that sits in gasoline with a little boot or a little sock at the bottom. And there's a fuel float, all right, just like the float in your toilet tank, all right. It's a little arm with a little hollow plastic float on there, and it sits at the fuel level. Now I'll tell you what, if you're accelerating and the gas goes over here, it's going to go down. If you're slowing down, it might buoy back up. Okay, so it'll move depending on what the ski's doing. So first, let's just consider that. Number two was that, so it takes forever for it to, for the actual sensor inside of the, inside of the fuel pickup. And I actually dug through all my stuff. I actually thought, I thought I had a couple fuel pickups I could, I could demonstrate. And so now I'm having to do pantomimes with my hands because I've sold my other fuel pickups. I had a, a really nice electric one that was going to, uh, that I had pulled out of one of the cars I built. And then I had an old school 1969 one that I pulled out of a super B. Um, and I don't have either now. So you're just gonna have to suffer through my stupid hand signals. So anyways, um, what would happen was that if you're looking at the, if you're looking at the gas gauge, it would take a while for the first two bars to drop down. And then all of a sudden the middle section of that gas gauge whoop, would drop. All right. Especially if you're using the ski all day, if you're going on a long ride or what have you. But then all of a sudden, bam, you'd be at two bars and your fuel alarm's going off. And everyone's going, holy crap, I'm out of gas? That's not possible. Well, what a lot of guys are finding out that it's the alarm will go off with seven, seven and a half, even eight gallons of gas in the tank. Well, for an 18 gallon, to 18 and a half gallon tank, people are like, well, that's really premature. That's really, really early. And meanwhile, the Kawasaki guys are in the background laughing their heads off because they're like, dude, we've been living with that since 07. Well, they got a 20 gallon tank. And they're like, we have that stupid thing going off with nine gallons in it. I mean, almost half the tanks left. Um, then for the first two years of the Ultra, 07 and 08, the fuel pickup didn't even pick up the last two gallons of gas. All right. Now there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. And it's exactly what I told you was that the fuel pump is inside of the gas tank. All right. And the fuel pump, just like any electric motor, has brushes in it. And those brushes are spinning around really fast and they get hot. All right. Well, for most in tank fuel pumps, what they do is that they use the outside fuel, the gas in the tank, to cool off the pump. So with your new car, your car outside, I don't care what you got. I don't care if it's a truck. I don't care if it's an SUV. I don't care if it's a little Honda Civic. Same thing with the fuel pump. The fuel pump's in the gas tank, all right? And it's using the gas in the gas tank to cool itself off. And every manufacturer is screaming at you, never run your tank dry. Why? Because it'll burn up your fuel pump. I mean, if you do it a lot. If you do it once, it's not going to kill it. But that's just common understanding for most mechanics, is don't run your fuel pump dry, okay? Same story goes with the Ultra. The Ultra's, I think the Ultra's using like a Bosch pump or a very similar to Bosch pump. And those pumps would burn up if you ran them really dry. So the idea was, well, we would just won't have the fuel sock or the fuel pickup grab those last couple gallons just because it keeps the temperature down. All right. Well, then a bunch of guys were saying like R&D racing was one of the first and um, believe it or not, uh, Wayne, uh, 
Yeah, Wayne at uh, um, uh, Watercraft Rider, he made one in like 07 or 08. So he made his own because he realizes like, hey, man, I got a ton of gas left in the tank. So guys were making extensions to extend the pickup to grab those last couple gallons. Anyway, let's get back to Yamaha. So the fuel alarm's going off really early, okay? Well, a lot of guys were like, well, listen, here's the, here's the easy thing to do. Just like your fuel t or just like your, your toilet tank, take the fuel pump out and tweak the, tweak the float. Just tweak the arm on the float. All right. You still get a positive reading at, when it's full and it's a little bit more progressive and it delays when the fuel chime goes off. Okay. It's not ideal. It's not what a lot of people really like to do. No one wants to manually bend something. But it was a Band-Aid. It was a Shade Tree Mechanic fix. All right. So this wasn't anything new. I actually reached out to the guys at Yamaha. I talked to the guys at Yamaha about this a couple times when I would go out and ride stuff. Go down to Georgia and go ride watercraft. I go, hey, what's going on with this fuel alarm? And the media guys would be like, what are you talking about? I'm like, oh, the fuel alarm goes off when you have eight gallons of gas left. And they start laughing. They're like, oh, yeah, it's because people are stupid. I go, okay, now I want it. Now I, now I need to hear a story. And the story was, was that uh, apparently people would just ignore the fuel chime alarm and keep riding. And then they get stuck on, you know, stuck out on the middle of the lake or offshore or wherever the heck they were. And they need to be towed back. And some people got stuck out there and called 911 and the Coast Guard took forever to find them. And now, and there was a lawsuit and some, you know, cause it's never, it's never your own fault for screwing up in this country. You know, it's always someone else's fault when you do something really dumb. Congratulations. Thank you, lawyers. You've screwed all of us. Now we have instructions on shampoo. So, uh, <laughs> anyways, so that was kind of, that was their answer. That was corporate's answer it was it's a safety measure. We had to do it because people are dumb and they won't listen to the fuel chime. So, and we're not going to put an auxiliary tank in there. You know, the you know, legal is saying, well, we got to put extra gas in the ski. And the mechanics are like, no, we don't. We got 18 and a half gallons here. We'll just move the alarm up. And that's all they did. It's an electronic preset. Okay. If you could crack into the code and go through and say, when do I want the fuel alarm to go off? You can adjust it. All right. It's not the dashboard. It was never the dashboard. It's not, a, it's not a mechanical error. It's software. So I thought, okay, and this and he was he was upset. This this guy who reached out to me, he was upset. And he'd been in contact with Yamaha uh, with the customer service, and he he'd been wearing his dealership out. And they're like, okay, well we're we'll make changes. We'll fix it. And they told him we were going to change the dash. I don't think that's really what's going to happen. And if it is, they're going to change his dashboard. There's something else going on. And there have been some things that have gone wrong with everything. I mean, with there's always going to be one or two outliers. So anyway, um, he thankfully is getting his watercraft fixed. Hopefully it resolves the issue and he's happy with it. I, I hope he's happy with it. You know, that's the best I could do is, is wish a guy good luck and hope that everything works out. Um, what was interesting was... About a month and a half, now about two months ago, I took our GTI SE out, the 170 out, and quite frankly, I didn't bring enough gas. I went too far, and I was on my way back, and I was going upstream. We had a really strong current coming up the, up the, uh, 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 up the Cumberland River. So I had to remember where I was. Uh, I was coming. I was going upstream up the Cumberland River, and I was devouring gas, even on eco mode. I was, I, I was going 35 miles an hour, and I'm just watching my gas go down because we were struggling to go upstream. And I mean, the current I think was something like se seven or eight knots. I mean, it was really cooking. So I was watching my gas go, and I started getting really nervous because, quite frankly, I had a couple of my kids with me. And I'm looking around. I'm like, well, there's not a lot of homes. There's no docks. And I actually waved down a, a, a two bass fishermen. And I said, hey, guys, do you have any gas? I don't care if it's premix. you have any gas? And they go, no, man, we didn't bring any gas. But, hey, listen, we're heading up that way. 
If you're stuck, wave us down. We'll drag you up to the lawn tramp. I said, great, thank you, I appreciate it. I'm just a little nervous. So I'm watching, I'm on one bar for a while, and I'm thinking, well, if I can get to the, if I can get to the lock, if I can get to the dam, I can make it to my side of the lake and I can get home. I think I'll be all right. And I get to, we, and I get to zero bars. There's not a bar on the, on the gas cage. And I'm thinking, okay, we're dead. I'm burning up the pump. I, I'm, I'm toast. I'm toast. And the alarm's been going off. And I, I really feel like I've just screwed myself and my, and my family. So I get to the lawn, or I get to the, do, uh, the, the dam, and a guy that I had met earlier, he was with his buddy. They were both Army guys, and they had their girlfriends, and they were in a boat. He comes up. He goes, hey, man, how you doing? You guys have fun? You go down? And we're like, we have made small talk. And I go, I go, hey, you don't happen to have any gas, do you? And he goes, no, why? And I'm like, oh, I ran the tank dry. And he starts laughing at me. And he's like, oh, man. Oh, what do you do? You know, and he starts chewing me on. I go, I know, I know, I know. And he goes, I got a rope. Let me tow you back. Where, where'd you put it in at? And I was less than a mile away from, from the dam. And he goes, I'll drag you there. I'm like, are you sure? And he goes, no, nah, I got a ton of gas. I'll drag you there. We're on our way back anyway. I said, he's like, you're on our way. So he gives me a tow back. Let's just go. We fire her up. I get it on the trailer. Kids come home. Everything's fine. Two days later, I go to the gas station. I'm like, all right, now I'm going to see how much gas is left in the tank. I start filling up. The stupid thing only took like 12 and a half gallons. I had almost three, ga I had almost three gallons of gas left with zero bars. Holy cow. Holy cow. I had three gallons of gas left on a 170. So I was like, all right, never mind, we're good. And again, that goes back to the fuel alarms are going to go off early, quite frankly, because dumb people have screwed it up for smart people. All right. Uh, I'm not trying to be a jerk, but that's the reality of things. All right. When there's instructions on a bar of soap saying, do not eat this soap. It's because some lawyer has been like, guys, we have to put these instructions on the box of soap because some moron started eating a bar of freaking ivory soap. Okay. All right. Hey, I'm really sorry. Believe it or not, I actually got a heat alarm. Um, so I took the case off. I'm sorry. That was really weird. I'm in my garage with the fan on. So I might have to turn this. I have a couple fans. I'm going to turn this fan on. Um, and hopefully. Hopefully it's not too noisy. I got a bunch of shop fans. Um, but yeah, I got a heat alarm. That's really weird. So I just took, I just took my case off. Okay. So oh, that is so noisy. I'm sorry, guys. Um, so, oh, let's move this. Let's try that now. Okay. So, um, what's going on with dashboards? Let's do a little bit of backup here. All right. We're in, we're in a world right now where you're seeing manufacturers move away from analog gauges and they're going to digital gauges. And the primary reason for that is that the watercraft themselves are going to digital, I say being analog, all right? They're all fly-by-wire throttle cables. There's no more throttle cables. Your, your throttle does not attach to the throttle body. It has a wire, there's a little servo inside of that throttle body. That's what opens up the flaps. And what we're seeing now is that a lot of these manufacturers I, s I know the drone from guys if the drone from the fan is too loud please let me know and I'll turn the fan off um, so as manufacturers go to digital they're having to upgrade their dashboards all right they're getting rid of the nice analog tachometers the nice analog speedometer uh, speedometer dials and they're going to digital now one of the neat things is that as a byproduct SeaDoo has their GPS 
uh, speedometers. And the nice thing about the GPS speedometers, although they're not perfect, they're pretty stinking close. Too loud. Okay, I'll turn it off. It's kind of what I thought. Okay. All right. It's all right. I, if I get another alarm, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back on. But it's it was like 84 degrees here in Tennessee at like 8 in the morning. So it's summertime now. Um, as manufacturers are getting rid of that analog and all those cables and all that, you know, all the hard steel cables, all right, they're going to digital. So they go, well, if we're going to go to digital, let's, let's make things a little, you know, let's add some extra fluff. Let's add some extra accessories. So in, in 2017, Yamaha's boat division, not watercraft, but their boat division offered what they called the Yamaha Connects system. So, so C-O-N-N-E-X-T, Connects, all right? And it was a touchscreen dash, all right? And the touchscreen dash had a bunch of pages on there, and it was, it was pretty well laid out so that it was offering the boat operator a lot of different uh, pages of information. I mean, just lots and lots and lots of information. And in addition to that, um, high beam indicator. <laughs> We're going to get to that. All right. Um, make sure to put your turn signals on when you're riding your, <laughs> riding your ST3. Um, but uh, one of the most interesting things was also that there was Bluetooth connectivity to your phone. Everyone was bringing their phones with them. All right, they were taking video, they were using it for GPS, they were doing all that kind of fun stuff, all right? Um, and so they said, well, heck, if everyone's gonna bring their phone, let's you know, have them make their playlist on their phone and play it through the sound system on their, on their boat. And a lot of aftermarket sound systems were already doing that, so they kind of jumped on the bandwagon. And that, in 2017, they went to the Kinect system, all right? When they redesigned the FX for 2019, they had a reductive, they, they, they kind of condensed the Kinex touchscreen and put it on the FX, all right? The Kinex system operates at idle, all right? You can be idling forward and you can still scroll through the, gate, through the pages or you're in neutral, okay? If you're going above print, I think you're, if you're going, I, I think you could be in no wake mode and still go through all the pages. But if you're going faster than no wake mode, it freezes it, and it's and you cannot do anything. You can bang on the screen all day long; it's not going to do anything. All right, there is a button underneath the the tilt steering, and it'll say pages on it, and it'll flip through the main page, which is your speedometer, tack, and fuel and, and trim, and then it'll go to your fuel page, and your fuel page will tell you will tell you you know miles to empty, um, how far you've gone. Your, your average fuel consumption. And that, that's a basic fuel page because a lot of guys who are long distance riders, a lot of guys who are calculating their fuel consumption so that they can get to the next stop if they're going on a long distance ride, they're going, okay, hey, listen, I got this amount of gas, I'm gonna slow down or I'm gonna speed up or I'm gonna do whatever. And so they're using that page live. And you can go 50, 60 miles an hour and hit that page button and it'll bring up your fuel consumption and your miles to empty. Other than that, you but you cannot touch it. You got to you got to use the button. All right, that's basic operation. Um, and they added some nice stuff with the Connect system on the FX as well. Primarily, it got rid of the key fob. Um, and I, I have funny stories about guys who had the key fobs crap out on them. They couldn't get their ski started, and I mean just nightmare stuff. Um, I never used the key fob. I just never did. Um, I just took the lanyard with me, uh, but so it gets rid of the key fob and it puts in like a four pin code. Um, so hopefully you're not using your bank pin number or your, your home, home alarm pin number. Um, otherwise, you know, they'll have your passwords. Uh, but yeah, so, and then you could like change the language and the, you know, from kilometers to miles and all that kind of fun stuff. You could do it all through the dashboard. All right. Um, and that is a technology that Yamaha is very happy with. They're very satisfied with. The part number for the dashboard has stayed the same from 2019 to 2020. Um, it is very likely to stay the same part number for 2021 and on. Um, I say that with a wink and a nod. 
Uh, and we're going to see more of that in the future. You know, that they're really happy with that technology. And that technology has done, done them well. Um, but everyone kind of said, well, hey, we're, what's going on with SeaDo? Because in 2018, when they redesigned the ST, you know, the RXTX and the ST3, and consequently the ST3, uh, the, the full size three seaters, they went to a whole new digital dash. They got rid of the analog dash and they have that new digital dash. Now, what's funny, and you've already commented, and I was going to make a joke about it, but you already beat me to the punch, was that the actual dash screen itself was almost directly lifted from the Can-Am Spider. All right. And that's their three wheeled motorcycle that they do. You know, the two wheels in the front with the one in the back. Um, and the, what's interesting about, though, about the spider, and it's actually really, really cool is at the same time. And I, I don't mind telling you this story because this, this is old news was I, I was sitting at the table with Jerry Gaddis from Green Hulk. I had Tim McCurcher from BRP marketing. We had, um, uh, Oh, Pascal, shoot, what's his name? He wasn't the, is he the brand manager of c -Doo? Crap. Um, had a high ranking Canadian there. I can't remember his name offhand. Um, and then we had some international guys and we we're sitting at one table and then there was another table with like the boat guys and stuff. And we were, we were in Henderson, Nevada. And, um, it was really cool is that they're, they're, they're doing the big walkthrough and the PowerPoint presentation and everything like that of the new ST threes and, and all the different features that were on it and the BRP premium audio. And, and I mean, we were, we were having the lids of our heads blown off while they're going through all this stuff. Um, it was really cool because Tim and Pascal, I swear his name's Pascal. He goes, Hey, uh, did you, did you see what we did with the, with the side by sides and the, and the spiders? I go, no, I, 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 sorry. I, I didn't know. And they're like, you need to look them up. And he showed me some of their stuff and the dashboards were full LCD, full color. And they had GPS and their, and sound system. And I was like, holy crap. Well, what that was, we, we didn't get that in the water, in the sea dues. All right. We got a very, very functional, very useful digital dash system. All right. LCD dash, not, it wasn't color, except that if it was dark, it would kind of have an orange backlight. Um, but what was cool was BRP's connect system. All right. That came out the same year, 2018. And the BRP Connect system, how that worked was the BRP Connect system uh, quite lit. Well, you had to do a couple things. There was some extra steps. Uh, you got your phone and you downloaded an app. All right. And the app kind of was a worm that came into your phone and said, OK, we've got his GPS. We've got his social media. And, and they quite literally could get your, could, you could get into Facebook, you get into your Instagram, you could get into your Twitter. And I think your Twitter, whatever. Um, you could get into all your social media apps, you can get into your maps, you get into uh, all your phone contacts and stuff like that. And it would also get into obviously your, your, your audio. And what you did though, is that you hard plugged it in so like, and you just put it, you know, there was a plug that went in the glove box or in the front storage bin to your phone. You put it in a little storage pocket and it locked your phone. You couldn't sit there and fart around on your phone. You, it locked your phone. But on the, da on, the, uh, on, on the handlebars, the handlebars had toggles and buttons on it. And there literally was a little thumb toggle, like a cursor. And you could navigate your maps on the dashboard. You can navigate your music choices through the dashboard. You could literally say, you know, make an Instagram post going, here I am, and kind of put a pin of where you were. I don't think you could take a picture or a selfie. We, uh, that wouldn't make sense. You couldn't do that. But you could kind of update and pin where you were. So there were certain things that they put into that system that were really, really cool. And everyone's like, oh, are we getting that? And it's like, well, hold on. 
let's just let's just wait and see. And that was something that just really wowed us, especially for the Spider guys and the Can Am guys. Um, there was a you know that offered a lot of connectivity to your social media and your phone um, into uh, into your your personal watercraft. Well, not your personal watercraft, but into your your Spider, your Can Am. Um, what's interesting, and I have done this. It's not ideal, but you can actually take and receive phone calls through your BRP audio sound system on your ski. Um, and it's actually really funny because it's like, where are you? You sound terrible. And you're like, oh, I'm in the middle of the lake right now. I just happen to have a signal. No one wants to answer their phone when they're on a ski. But if you need to make a call, just disconnect it. Don't use your sound system. It doesn't sound good. Um, but why I bring this up is that we are seeing a trend. I mean, just pay attention to the trends. We're seeing that the technology already exists. And the technology is getting better. And the more they use that technology, the cheaper it gets. So it is very possible, whether it's next year or five years from now, we might see the BRP Connect show up on a personal watercraft. I, again, I do not know. So it, it might be next year. It could be five years from now. One of the things though, and it, I have to make a point of this, is that BRP literally made a very vocal statement. We did not want a touchscreen. We didn't want a touchscreen. And that primarily was because they didn't want riders taking their hands off of the handlebars and poking around on the screen. They just didn't want that. All right. So they put all the controls on the handlebars. That is, I mean, that's, that goes back to the whole brake and reverse system. It was some of the first advertising that they did was like, no, you don't have to take your hands off the handlebars to hit reverse. You just do it with your left hand. All right. And that was the, the appeal of IBR was keep your hands on the handlebars. So anything that we see, and I've been kind of clamoring for this because, quite frankly, I don't like having to reach down for the sound system. I would like to see the sound system integrated, at least the sound system controls integrated onto the handlebars. I think that would be a really smart step in the future. And I know it's a pain in the butt for a lot of dealers because if dealers are like, hey, listen, we got to put the sound system on, now you got to snake it up through the handlebars, and now you got to put, um, uh, now you got to put something on the handlebars itself, and now you have a new a new pod of controls on the handlebars. But, especially, quite frankly, with the GTIs, the GTIs, the control pad is kind of tucked in into, into kind of the knee, and it's it, the cowling kind of covers up the pad, so you gotta shove your fingers in there. It's, a, it's wonky, it's just, it's not smooth. And that's really weird because c is actually really, really good at ergonomics they're real good at ergonomics so i was kind of surprised with that choice um that's a that's just kind of a weird one so my hope is to see the brp premium control pad being both there and then also on the handlebar at some point um, i think that would be a home run i think that'd be a really good idea for the future um and anything if they do upgrade the dashboards in the future I bet you 10 bucks, it's not gonna be a touch screen. It's gonna all be controlled and manipulated through the handlebars. Um, that, may, that might make your handlebars look really complicated, but I would rather be messing with my fingers and my hands than taking my hands off and doing that, especially at speed. So again, we'll see what the future holds when it comes to that. I think the technology's there. I think the, the interest is there. Quite frankly, I honestly think that people would pay the premium for it. Um, I don't think they'll have an option saying, oh, do you just want the LCD dash or do you want the new digital, you know, full color digital dash with map options and all that kind of stuff. I think it's going to be like, this is what you're buying. This is it. Um, I don't think they're going to be like, you know, deluxe and simple. You're, it's going to be, you know, just grabbing that. Um, 
Phone's freezing again. Think you need the fan on. Um, phone's not hot, and I'm not getting an alarm. And, but that's concerning that the phone got hot. Shoot. Uh, and my battery's good. All right, I'm I'm just double checking stuff, guys. So I just want to make sure that we're we're in good shape here. Um, Garmin unit that's optional for Sea-Doo. Reads me my text while I'm writing. Yeah, as well as Facebook messages. Um, I personally have a problem with with that. I think there. I think you're robbing yourself of the escapism of getting on a personal watercraft and going out and riding. I think you're doing yourself a disservice. Um, just a heads up. Happened twice while you were talking. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. Hopefully, it doesn't happen tonight, Jason, with our with our podcast. It'll be a little cooler too, um, and I'll do it without the phone case. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of have a problem with like getting you know instant messages while I'm out on the water. Um, but here's the thing: is the Fish Pro what the Fish Pro has done? Well. What the Fish Pro has done for the enthusiast rather than the fishing enthusiast more has it, it's shown to manufacturers that enthusiasts would would really like a really integrated, a really high level GPS system, a high level Garmin or TomTom Tom or you know whatever other unit. Um, I think a lot of people would rather have that information. I think they'd rather have a full color screen with a depth sounder and, you know, uh, all the water information and uh, tide charts. I think a lot of people really want it. I mean, look at how many folks are buying the, the Garmin GPS fish finder system and putting them on GTXs and RXTs. Um, it's enough that it's now, quite frankly, it's an accessory in the catalog. So that speaks, that speaks louder than anything else to me. Um, people, yeah, okay. Yeah. They're, they're selling the fish pro tank for people who don't have the fish pro extension, but they're putting the big 13 and a half gallon tank on the back because they want to pack it full of drinks or sandwiches or whatever. Um, but I'm more I'm seeing more of more interest in people putting the GPS unit on their sea dues and Yamaha to that degree has their GPS pathfinder or their GPS finder, um, option. And, and, and that goes into their, you know, their Ram mount on the dashboard and they're very happy with that Ram mount dashboard accessory system. It's, it's quadrupled the size of their catalog. Uh, but it's not, I mean, yeah, it works. It works. It works great. But that little screen compared to the Garmin seven and a half inch screen, forget it, forget it, you know? And I think dealers would be smart to have some of those GPS systems in stock and go, Hey, you know, this will fit a GTI, right? Would you like full GPS on your GTI or your GTR 230 or any one of your ST3s? We'll put it on for you. I think they'd sell every one of them, personally. Now, not everyone's going to want one. There's just people who just want to fart around on the lake and goof off and have the kids ride on inner tube. Great. Perfect. Whatever. They don't have to have it. But I think a lot of people who are interested in going out and doing long rides and, and chart plotting, ooh, they'd sell every one of them. I think so. That's my opinion. Um, but anyway, that's kind of what I want to talk about today. Uh, I kind of rambled a little too, a little further than I wanted to, but eh, that's me. That's what I do. I ramble. Um, but again, I think there's some really exciting, uh, exciting things on the future. Um, we're seeing the stock market pick up. We're seeing a lot more jobs being added. Uh, we're starting to pull out of the nosedive. And I know a lot of states are, are seeing more uh, more COVID numbers. Obviously, that lends itself to the more you test, the more results you get. Um, but 
once the panic simmers down and people go, okay, yeah, well, I felt kind of crappy for three days and then I drank some Pedialyte or a Gatorade and I feel better now and they tested positive, they're like, oh, that was it? Okay, well, cool. And then, you know, people are, who might be at risk, they're smart and they take precautions, great. And we're, I think we're just gonna see, we're gonna see things mellow out in the next two months. I really do. Um, I think the news won't mellow out because they have a dog in this fight. But um, I think we'll, we'll see a lot of things getting pulled around really fast. And a lot of people, um, a lot of people are, well, okay, I'll give you an example. I'll give you a really good example, a good example. Um, right now the manufacturers, uh, primarily Sea-Doo and Yamaha are pushing to get the watercraft, the 2021 models into the hands of dealers upwards to a month early. I've heard, uh, I've heard as high as six weeks early than normal. Because a lot of them are quite honestly empty. They're just empty. And I, one, of my, one of my favorites is that I've actually heard that some of the dealerships are sending out like their, kid, you know, their teenage porters and their 20-year-old guys in trucks. And they're going to like Facebook Marketplace and they're going to Craigslist. And they're buying up used watercraft, bringing them back. They do a polish on them. They change out some of the plastics that have been scuffed up. They maybe change out some of the decals that have been scratched. And then they sell them as certified pre-owned because they've done, you know, they do a quick service on them and they, and they just put some lipstick on the pig and they go, Hey, certified pre-owned. It's got 150 hours on it. You know, we'll sell it to you at this price. And it's for way more than they bought it for, but they're going out and they're buying, they're snatching up everything that's in private hands. And I've heard that. I've probably heard that about six times, five or six times from different dealers so, um, uh, just the demand is through the roof. All oh, the demand is through the roof. It is people want a personal watercraft right now. They want boats and they want jet skis and they are going, they're climbing over each other to get them. So th that's why they're like, we got to strike when the iron's hot. We got to get these watercraft out. We got to fire them out. We got to fire them out. Um, I'll tell you this. Yamaha has changed, has flipped the script on me three times now. They're like, dude, can you get here sooner? How fast can you do this? What's the turnaround? We're going to move things up. Uh, are you okay just riding three skis and then we'll have you come back to do the other three? I mean, they're just like, how fast can you do this? It's like, oh, holy crap. All right, well, you're messing with my schedules a lot. You know, let me see what I can do. So everyone's in a hot dash to get these things out. So it's going to get really exciting. I think it's going to get into like a neck and neck race. I think it's going to be kind of fun. Um, all right. Talked about the slippery stuff. Talked about the podcast tonight. Yeah, Buddy Productions. Uh, me, me with uh, Ken G and Jason Frank. Um, we're gonna. We're, it's at eight p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So uh, yeah, tune in for that. And uh, I know they're gonna spam it everywhere in all the groups and stuff. But I'm gonna try to share it on the Personal Watercraft. I almost said Personal Watercraft Illustrated. Oh my gosh! Wow. That magazine shut down 11 years ago. I just had a Joe Biden moment. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> wow. On the Watercraft Journal. <laughs> I'm an idiot. All right. Let's look at some questions here, and then I'm going to get out of here. It's easy to get turned around in the water. Yes. Yeah. I have a three-year-old on the shore with my wife. If they need it, it's nice to know. Yeah. Uh, fingers crossed, heads up. Okay, phone's freezing. No, uh, no need to touch a screen. Um, I mean, their argument was, you know, that they get smudged or they can get damaged. But again, Yamaha puts it in going, well, you don't do it at speed. You're not going 50 miles an hour and then hitting your screen. So, um, and I see, the, I see the usefulness on both sides. And I see the functionality um, and I, I personally like the ergonomics of having your hands on the handlebars. I think that's ideal. The problem is, is that I think people get confused because there's so many buttons and you're, you're riding and you're trying to use your index finger and your thumb and you're trying to set this. And so it gets a little wonky, but we'll see what happens. I think, the, I think the innovation's there and technology is only going to get better. Um, 
I one of my biggest complaints years ago, I mean like when we started the journal in 13 was the response time on Yamaha's buttons were terrible. They were terrible. Like the electric trim and like the no wake mode, you had to hold it down for like two beats and you had to like hold the trim. You couldn't do fast response trim. See, you could sneeze hard and it would set the trim. And I loved that quick response stuff because if you're going through buoys or you're going through some real tight stuff, you're like, I'm going to drop the nose. I'm going to bring the nose up. I'm going to do this. You know, or I'm going to set, you know, the cruise control or you know, bump it, the cruise control up or down or whatever. Sea-Doo's response for their, their buttons at the time were way, way ahead of Yamaha and Cowie. And I know Yamaha and Cowie has the same supplier. Um, and, but Yamaha over the years, like the Yamaha button response time is, is just as fast as CDs now. So they're great. So that's, that's, you know, again, technology just improves over time. All right. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Garmin unit optional for CD reads my text while I'm writing. Okay. I talked to you. I talked about that. The ATVs have that. Most guys we ride with, the miles to empty, so that's a good idea on the part. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, see a built-in GPS with depth finder on the Yamaha. I think this is speculation. This is just inside baseball. Um, quite frankly, they don't want to raise the price point high enough. They don't want to make it standard equipment because it's gonna raise the price point up pretty high. And a lot of people are gonna complain and you go, I don't want it. So instead they go, well, let's just make it an option through the dealership. Let's just make it an option um, that's easily installed. You could do it at home or you can have your dealer do it. Doesn't require a whole heck of a lot. And that's why they're more comfortable making it a dealer option and less of a built-in unit. Um, that might be a bad excuse that might, that might be unsatisfactory for most folks, um, but I, I see where they're coming from on that. You gotta kinda put your empathy hat on and go, okay, well, why would they make that choice? Is there a logical reason why they made this choice? And, you know, is there a, is there a equally logical reason to go the other way? And if you can't, if you can't do a pro and con list, you know, the T list, of pros and cons and you can't get more pros and cons then you kind of have to side with their choice um all right let's keep going yeah high beam indicator and turn signals yeah everyone kind of got a good laugh out of that um it was just because that that lcd screen was the same screen uh with the the pre-cast silk screened icons at the bottom everyone's like hey high beams and turn signals so anyway um all right, too loud. Plus, they showed how to bend the float. Yeah, yeah, we did that on the tank on the tank swap. That's true. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, again, I don't want to villainize anyone who, who who was having a problem with that early alarm chime on the Yamahas. Um, it's annoying. Ding, ding, ding. I know I got nine gallons left. Leave me alone. Shut up. I'll tell you what. I did a, when I did my last photo shoot with Yamaha, we had half a tank of gas in the skis. Cause they're like, Kevin's not going for long distance here. He's doing a three, a two hour, three hour film shoot. All right. I had the alarms going off with half, you know, not half a tank of gas, but by the time I was done, it was going off and they're all laughing at me. They're like, oh, you're eating all the gas. I'm like, this stupid thing. It's a safety precaution. Again, don't eat the shampoo. We have instructions on how to... There's instructions on Pop-Tarts, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry, phone rang. I can't believe it rang. But yeah, we have instructions on Pop-Tarts. So that's how stupid people are. And that's why they do it. Sorry. All right. Let's see here. I had five different fuel alarms on my Wake Pro. Got back to the ramp, no no bars, things filled up, took, oh yeah. Yeah, you're right, Len, it's ridiculous. Um, hey, I have stuff to give away. 
I have stuff to give away. All right. Um, last time I gave something away, it was the Specs Amphibian Eyewear. All right. I, I was instead of a pair of goggles this time, they've got. Do do do. Well, we got everyone gets whoever wins gets a koozie, um, and you can choose between the blue or the green. And the reason why I'm giving you a choice is because, dang it, dang it, dang it, dang it. All right. They started making these really kind of neat uh, sleeves so you don't burn your arms. You don't have to wear a full length rash guard, but you can put these forearm elbow sleeves, these quarter sleeves, and not burn your arms to death. And they made some out of neoprene, these big, thick neoprene ones. And then they got the nice blue kind of gasoline looking, <laughs> look like gasoline to me, you know, when you spill gas on the ground. Um, these are the nice kind of thinner material ones, okay? And then we got another pair of these kind of tropic jungle ones. So I'm gonna pick, I'm gonna go through the comments Done. I'm not going to discuss it right now on camera, but I'm going to go through the comments and I'm going to pick the best comment. And if you're stateside, I'm not paying for Canada or New Zealand or Australia. I'm sorry. Um, but I'll send you a koozie and one of these, uh, a pair of these arm shields. And you let me know if you like them. You let me know if they work out for you. Okay. All right, guys. Thank you very much. I know this was a lot longer than I was expecting to. I was trying to do like a half an hour and I'm pretty sure I'm over an hour. Um, but hope you guys are doing good again, please watch the podcast tonight. It should be fun. Um, we'll see what they even want to talk about. I have no idea. And we will uh, talk to you soon and look out for that next video. And please, we are getting close. We are getting actually really close. I think we're like 1100 or 1200 subscribers away from 10,000 subscribers on the YouTube channel. Please, please, please share you share some of our YouTube videos and help people Help encourage people to subscribe so that we can get to 10,000. Getting to 10,000 is a big watermark on YouTube, and they're going to start showing our stuff more often on people's search pages, and we can also put up our store. So that's a really big thing. I don't charge anyone for the magazine. I don't charge anyone for video. We're advertiser-supported. We're entirely free to you guys. So the least you could do is maybe subscribe to our YouTube channel. That would be really great. So thanks again, guys. Have a good day. We'll talk to you soon. I'm done.